Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Of our next speaker, someone that we all know well and whose commitment to this apostolate for so long has uh, made it possible uh, for many people to understand in a very personal way, a very pastoral way, something that is complex and controversial. And Angelo's touch on the phone, by email, in person, is something that's been a great blessing for us. And like Tina, uh, Angelo also was another good soul attracted by Father Harvey's good soul, and now we're going to hear from him. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace. Amen. Well, like Tina, when I was asked to do the testimony, I um, immediately tensed up and probably wanted to evaporate. <laughs> and, um, but in all honesty, you know, I, I asked myself, I, I guess, why me? And um, it really didn't... Um, I guess I didn't want to talk about myself. I didn't want to dig into the past or sound foolish and get into the whole human respect thing. But it didn't take long before realizing it really wasn't about me per se. And um, I realized that I'm a walking miracle. And by God's grace, you know, the Lord wants me to share this good news because when I think back, being in the lifestyle was bondage, and I didn't know anything other. I would have never thought that I would be standing here, and um, the lifestyle could eat you up and chew you out, as, you all, as many of you know. I also wanted to do it for Father Harvey, who loved courage and encouraged very much. So I yielded to the Holy Spirit, and it was like flipping through a photo album portions of my life was flashing before me. So um, this is where I begin. I immediately see a lost boy, a small boy. Um, one of my sisters had once told me that my mother used to tell her to, you know, go over to Angelo, he looks so sad. And I'm the youngest of six, six children and um, three girls, I had three big sisters and then three boys. I, um, another image came to me right away. I, you know, I saw myself just going from room to room at night. I just felt so alone and so lost. I just wanted to sleep with someone. So it was like from brother to brother to sister. I mean, it was really good if I can get in the bed with my mother and father. Um, I was just so scared. I think back, it was almost as if I didn't exist. I don't know if any of you, it was almost as if I, I just felt like I, I, I wasn't there. Um, or like I didn't want to be in anybody's way. Um, but this wandering just continued for many years into my adulthood, including from going from bed to bed, of course. Um, we're an Italian Catholic family, uh, and I grew up in a crowded housing project on Staten Island, New York. And like many with this struggle at a very young age, I, I, of course, I just didn't fit in. And I've, you know, many of you know it, I've heard it said by many, given their testimony, and I, I just wasn't like the other boys, or, or, although, I mean, that's what I perceived. It was during these times I also thought my father didn't like me. Um, he worked two jobs and was not around a lot. But what was disturbing is the fact that he was kind and funny to neighbors and friends, and I used to see that, and I just didn't get it. Um, a, a very painful memory for me was, I remember being young, and we used to go to the beach a lot. My father was a lifeguard at one point many years ago, and um, I was at Rockaway Beach, and my father was holding me in the water, and I mean, it meant everything for me because there was really, I mean, it was everything. And I remember a wave came and I slid off of him and I could still feel the slipping off his skin. 
And I just said, he, he let me go. You know, I just, I just didn't get it. And yet, another memory that came to mind was years later, though, I guess this was somewhat redemptive. I was probably like around 12 years, and fear gripped me after seeing, and I have to mention, Exorcist 1. It's weird you mentioned Exorcist 2. But I saw Exorcist 1, and I, 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 that film scared the living crap out of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. And it lasted for, I remember a few months, like day in and day out, I used to think of this. It was awful. And I was getting these like obsessive, intrusive thoughts of this movie, and it was terrible. I, I was holding this in. I wasn't saying anything to anybody. And yet, I, I believe a sibling, someone told me that it, eventually it was written on my face. I, I guess it, they saw something was wrong with me. And um, I sat with my father, and he spoke to me and just told me things like, well, you know, God's more powerful than, every, than anything. And, you know, this is just a movie. And it went away like that. I mean, I just needed to hear my father, you know, just give me, comfort me and give me security that I guess I never felt from him, so. But like that. You know, perception has so much power and played into my ambivalence towards men. Um, I just thinking of how many times I've spoken to parents and, and, and I've heard their struggles and, and I've heard them say that they've done everything that they can, you know, with their children and to be there. And, and I just remember saying, you know, so very often the child itself has so much needs, you know, that you can only do so much. You know, the rest is really divine intervention. Um, in my situation, I've asked my siblings about certain occurrences at home, but it didn't seem to phase them. Or, or you know, I think what it comes down to, they, they weren't getting angry at these situations that I was getting angry at, uh, especially with my father. Um, I mean, one of my older sisters, Vera, who many of you know, she identifies with that same-sex attraction. And eventually, you know, I mean, she had a conversion and came back to the church and eventually worked for Father Harvey years, you know, down the line, um, but there was some. We, we would we would speak. We would speak about like what went on, and and it's great. There's one wonderful thing about speaking to siblings. I mean, you have similar fears, and you have similar. You know, you can really work things out with each other, and that's been a blessing for me, especially as I as I've gotten older. Um, so naturally. It was easy to identify with girls, and I carefully surrounded myself with them. Um, I remember the lure towards um, playing with dolls, and um, I didn't have any. I, I, I didn't have any, but would borrow and you know the girls that I played with. And you know, I, I could only play with the Ken doll, although Ken wasn't even enough. I wanted the GI Joe, and I, I couldn't get. I just GI Joe was tough, you know. Um, <laughs> But it, it was, let me tell you, in the projects playing with dolls, I remember it was, uh, there was strategy involved because I had to, we had to play at a certain place and if I saw anybody coming, you know, I kind of like would turn, turn around and, uh, you know, because, you know, in this situation, any bit of weakness, anything, you were ranked on, forget it, you know, and that's, I, I had to protect myself there. I mean, I, it was teasing, but it didn't crush me and I, I, it wasn't really brutal. I was a survivor, and, and, and I knew something had to be done, though, and I discovered basketball. And it was like my way back into the pack. It, it was wonderful, and I loved it. I loved it. It was a, a great escape, and I was pretty good. Um, I was fast, and, and what was really nice is some of the older boys, the teens, used to call me muskrat <laughs> because I was fast. And it was really nice because I was being noticed. I, I was getting attention and affirmation was coming my way. That was a big deal. It, was, it, it really meant a lot. Um, I was the type of kid that got along with everyone and thus made, you know, that's how I made my way through the high school years. Uh, this was 
a time though when marijuana entered my life and the feelings of SSA were beginning to take hold of me. You know, it's, it, it's sad because in hindsight, I mean, it's nothing profound, but even the, the pot smoking was a way to connect, was a way to be, to be accepted, uh, but it came at a cost. Um, interesting, it's really sad because I remember, you know, and this is real brokenness, but you know, and not wanting to hurt anybody else's feelings, you know, I, I compromised my own. You know, and I, I look back and it, it was just really, really sad, just to be accepted. Um, my emotional life consumed me and gave way to compulsive behavior, you know, drugs, masturbation, smoking, and it just a fantasy life, just somewhere where I could just escape and, and medicate. It just all seemed too hard. Eventually, the next step was to participate in the sex act and to devour another man, what I'm lacking. And even when I was writing this, I think of Moberly's theory. I mean, I can understand that very, very much so, how you just want to devour the person that you're with, that you're having sex with, because you just feel, I felt inadequate. Um, something in me became unleashed, and thus the drug, and thus the gay life. Um, in no time, a partner, gay bars, the double life, the shame, the hiding. Um, I'll, I'll spare the sort of details. Um, in 1983, I was just short of 23 years old, I took off to San Diego. And in a way, that was good for me to leave home and to learn to care for myself, you know, to, to, to mature that way, because I, I had sort of like a... Um, a symbiotic relationship with my mother even, and I knew that I had to kind of break that, and, and she knew also, and, and she gave me her blessing. Um, I had dropped out of college. I, I didn't have any direction. I didn't have direction at all. As I said, my emotions were holding me hostage, was holding my intellect hostage, so I just couldn't enter into college. It was too, I just couldn't do it. Um, I, I, I vividly remember saying goodbye to my parents at the airport and knew and knew that God will always take care of me. I didn't know the person of Jesus, but I knew God would take care of me. It was the seeds that were planted a long time ago. You know, I mean, my, I, I think of the faith of my mother. Um, I also had an aunt who was a cloistered nun, and I'm sure her prayers helped all of us. A couple of years in San Diego, and eventually I, I headed up to Los Angeles, up to West Hollywood. And there, every, every person and everything was gay. Um, it was more drugs, Donna Summer. <laughs> the gym, which was like a temple, and, and just a lot of gay drama, as many of you know. Um, I had a partner from South Africa who eventually, I was very sad, he died of AIDS. But, um, Even though I had a partner, there was a lot of sexual activity outside of our relationship. I remember I even got caught up in, I was dealing drugs, dealing marijuana. I remember going out to Indiana several times. It's funny because when I meet people from Indiana, I, I get like trance-like, you know, because it kind of like, oh God, I remember that, you know, being... <laughs> No offense, I met great people here from Indiana. <laughs> I'm just saying, every time I hear Indiana, you know. Um, but these addictions, I mean, they, they consumed me. And the very fact that I, um, you know, the very fact that, again, it was, I felt accepted, like in that lifestyle. It might have been, it was not authentic, but I, you're accepted and you belong and it felt good. and. And like nothing else mattered. I mean, I, I remember in the day, and I hate to say this, but you know, it, it was you know, it was wonderful in that sense. Um, but it was tough. It, it was also 1980s, and, and, and AIDS was was happening. And um, I remember I was uh, had a very good friend who had AIDS, and, and I was over there, and I was helping him out, and, and I remember. At one point, he was calling my name, and I didn't know what was going on. And 
the AIDS, had, he was going blind as I was, and he was crawling on the floor. And I just knew something, this isn't good. This isn't good. I remember always, always, always looking and searching like that little boy. It just went on. I was just always searching, wandering, wandering the streets, something. I didn't know what it was, but I can just see myself walking in the streets and just always just so empty and always looking for someone to save me because I just didn't have it. Um, it's interesting, when I was writing this, and all of a sudden it came up, I remember my mother wanted to visit me during this time, and I was living in a, a one bedroom with Andrew, and, and I had to tell her on the phone, prior to her arrival, I only had a one bedroom apartment, so it would have been a given, you know, I had to say something. And um, I told her about myself, and her response, very calmly, but with authority, she just said, you know what the church teaches? Well, my mother just did a slam dunk on me because I didn't know, you know, it just, it, 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 was, it was, wow. Um, it was set in love, and I loved her all the more for it. Maybe not at that moment, but there was something about that. I, 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 there was a lot of gratitude, and, and it really helped the trip. It helped to be with her. No, I, I needed to hear that. Um, she was, a real, she was a real neat lady. Uh, in 1993, my life took a major turn with the sudden death of my mother. She just had a massive heart attack, and I received a call on the morning of May 3rd, and I was in New York by the evening. And at the funeral home, uh, there was a priest, a Father Francis Marino, who would eventually play, play more of a part in my life, was saying some inspirational words and at one point, he just looked at me and said, you know, God sometimes takes a life to save a life. And I knew what he meant. But it was at my mother's funeral mass that I first met Father Harvey with Gary, a courage member here tonight. And I'll be honest, I remember when I saw Father Harvey, I said, oh God, it's him. <laughs> My sister used to always spoke so fondly of Father Harvey, but you know, to me, he was in charge of them. <laughs> and, um, but it was beautiful. You know, my sister, when she worked with Father Harvey, she used to send me the newsletters. And, you know, it's interesting how the divine intervention, because I, I never, I don't remember throwing them away. I used to put them in a cupboard. I could still see where I used to put them. I don't even think I looked at them, but I just kept them there. Um, Needless to say, that was a very, very chaotic year. I, I, I left my job at Disney. I was working for Disney um, um, Studios, and um, it was just more destructive behavior. And um, I, I would say a start of, a, of an emotional breakdown. It was very, very frightening. Again, some very crazy, scary, intrusive images um, and thoughts day in and day out. Uh, it was agonizing. Um, from the minute I woke up, and it lasted for several months, and I thought, I, this is it, I'm, 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 I'm losing it. Um, very scary, it almost, I, I, when I think back, it could have gotten a little, like, psychotic. It was just really, really, really intense. Um, I, I finally reached out to my brother, who by now, he was, or, he was ordained a priest, a late vocation, and um, Again, like I said, you know, he knew these fears himself and he had worked through them, so he was really good to speak to at the time. Because for him, this wasn't so crazy what I was going through. So that really helped me out, and he was an older sibling, and, and I needed that from him. Um, 
he did, he suggested, I remember the rosary. And I, I would just remember saying, like, I, I think many of you might have experienced this, like, how do I say it? I, I kind of remember, I forget, you know, and, 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 but even in that, though, I, I'll tell you, I remember like it was yesterday, I remember saying, what the hell happened to me? What happened? You know, I, that was so disturbing. I, I entered into it and I started saying it, uh, praying the rosary, and, and I could tell you it was from my heart. It was real, real good medicine. Um, eventually, after that, um, I had a tremendous experience. Um, uh, I, I, it ended up being Mercy Sunday, but what, what did I know about Mercy Sunday? Um, but I remember the, 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 the priest mentioning the Holy Spirit, and, and something hit me. I just remembered, oh, that's the, you know, that's the bird. That's the dove, <laughs> you know? I, I, I just said, uh, you know, I just thought back when I was a kid, you know, and it was great because it was just soothing to see that image and to come, almost, you know, to come upon me. Um, and then soon after that, it was, there was a major change in my life. Um, in July of 1995, my brother, Father Charles, Charlie Charles, uh, called and dropped a bomb on me because he said to me, how would you like to go to a courage conference in the Bronx? And I was, it just floored me. He said he'd pay for everything and personally get me there himself. It just floored me. And, but I knew in my heart I had to go, just had to go. Um, initially, there was no room at the inn, as they say, but um, Maria, at the time, um, had told my brother that somebody had canceled at the last minute. They even left a deposit for me, yeah. I said, oh, God's faithfulness, um, good example of his faithfulness. Uh, the first day of the conference, at the entrance of the Passionist Retreat House in Riverdale, I, panic sort of like your trench coat experience. I'm sure it was the same thing. I, 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 um, but I, I, I met a, um, a vivacious, very friendly, affable pastoral priest who set me at ease. And Father Timon just gave me this big, big welcome. And I knew something said, this guy's gonna be instrumental in my life. And, and he is, he's a good friend to this day. And I knew he was a keeper. Um, but from the moment the conference began, I couldn't stop crying. It was a little embarrassing. <laughs> I would hear a talk, go to my room and cry. Share at meals, go to my room, cry. Um, David Morrison gave his testimony that year, and during one of my crying sessions on, on the grass hill overlooking the Hudson, he came up to me, and it was really beautiful the way we shared. It was really a, a tender moment, and I needed that from another brother in Christ. Um, after the conference, it was just so dramatic that uh, I went back to, uh, to West Hollywood and I was attending, um, I belonged to St. Victor's Parish, and I just remember asking the pastor, what, what about this, the, when I was at this retreat, they had this like adoration, you know, and he said, well, what do you mean what about it? We have it here every week. <laughs> kind of hit me, you know, I, what, what, what did I know? But, but he did say to me, if you want it, I just wanted it more and more. He told me about these, this Dominican, these Dominican sisters at the foothill of the Hollywood Hills. And I'll tell you, that's probably why that place hasn't blown up yet, because these nuns are there praying. Beautiful community. Um, eventually, through that prayer, I, I had contacted, I, I knew I had to get out of there. I, you know, how do you do this conference and then go back to West Hollywood? Um, I had contacted uh, the Anawan community, which is a lay Catholic community my sister had belonged to and my brother. And I, and I knew them over the years, and this is that France, Father Francis Marino who spoke at the funeral. He was the, the founder of the community. And, um, and the co-founder is, uh, is a Sister Barbara who was in the Blessed Sacrament Sisters with my aunt. So, you know, it all kind of connects. Um, so basically, uh, talk about a grace. I mean, I sold, I sold most of my belongings, shipped the rest, and got out of Dodge. I was out within 90 days. I left after the conference. I was out of West Hollywood in 90 days. 
and I ended up uh, back east in, in, uh, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. It, that was a little tough. It was like going from West Hollywood and Sunset Boulevard to the banks of the Delaware River. It was a little, <laughs> it was hard, but you know, it was a death to self, but we do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, they actually put me in a house for like nine months. There were no, there were no men, single men down there at the time, so um, it was interesting. The, the nine months, needless to say, a lot of tears. It was that snowstorm of 96. I didn't know what hit me. I was in California all those years. Um, I was in vans and doing 360s. It was, it was tough. It was a real... But you know what? It was all part of my healing process when I, when I think back. And you know, I had to trust someone, and why not these people? I knew that God had led me to them. Um, and the Anawim community was wonderful. They catechized me and re-catechized me. It was wonderful, you know, it was, we dialogued daily. We, we the, the liturgy of the hours, it was a nightly exam, and it was community. I, I really didn't know what community was, but it was community. It was wonderful. And in time, I was asked to go to the Philippines. I was there for a couple of years for formation and interestingly enough to help moderate the courage meetings there because the Anawim community had brought courage to the Philippines and they, till this day they still oversee Father Dan who, who has been at this conference a couple of years ago they still oversee the courage um, apostolate um, it was a real blessing um, I had been attending courage meetings in the Lehigh Valley and also um, Father Timon, once again, was running meetings at St. Agnes in New York City, so it was really good, the, the fellowship there and what I was learning. Um, I, I, you know, when I think back, I was finding purpose in my life. I, I really never had any purpose. And, you know, living in community had its challenges, but it helped me to grow. And, and I realized that transformation and freedom was happening, uh, although my addictive side wanted out. Um, life had gotten somewhat, you know, it had gotten sterile for me, but, I, you know, I was so, you know, where's my next kick, where's my next, you know, in the lifestyle, and it, it's always that next, you want that kick. And, and I was really, living in community really helped me that, you know, life isn't about that. I was growing up. You know, if I may, there is an intense warlike aspect to this struggle, and for men with SSA, it's so constant. The visuals, the images, wanting the fix. Um, I, I heard many members say at meetings, and including myself, I know this, that they thought that they would die if they didn't see that image, that pornographic image. Eventually, I, I, I physically, I left the animal community after four years. I never left the spirituality, which continues to anchor me in my faith, and that's, I know, what kept me and got me here at Courage. Um, and in time, Father Harvey in the Courage office entered, you know, enters the picture. Um, at, at first, actually in 2000, uh, Tina and Father Harvey took me in as a part-timer while seeking full-time employment um, in the New York City area. I had gone back into the New York City area. And then again in 2005, of course, Father Timon contacted me regarding a full-time position. There's a story here, but I'll save it for another time, like later on this evening, a good pint. Because <laughs> there's a story. But anyway, uh, um, it was baptism by fire, believe me. Um, I can attest to the supernatural powers that be, having worked this end of the vineyard. Um, at the time, um, at I was attending courage meetings in the Metuchen Diocese. It, it was just a, a, a joy to work, you know, with, with Tina and Pat, Frank and Sister Dolores, Julie. Great volunteers, you know, Richard, Ken, and Jim are just top shelf volunteers. Christine, and now with Father Chuck and Jerry and Michelle, it's just been a real, real, real gift. Um, courage for me it equates to community. Staying connected with each other is not just important, but it's vital. It's a powerful and grace-filled moment to call one of my brothers, or they call me at the onset or in the midst of a lust attack. Someone to listen, 
you know, we're all wounded healers. And, and this is such a good tool, and I, and I share this with, with you here. I mean, this is the good fight in growth. You know, when you feel it coming on, just pick up the phone. You know, we, we meet each other here, and, and we need each other. Um, and I'll tell you, very often the person that's calling, <laughs> they're looking for help, but it's the other guy that gets the more help. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the two coming together. Because then you hang up and you, almost, you feel needed. You know, you feel like, you know, so empowered. And that's chastity. I've been very, very fortunate to have established close relationships with my Courage and Encourage family, and so special to even, I mean, God bless me, and I know there's people when we, you know, work in the office and they say they live in these places that there's no one here, and, and I always know that God will look after them and, 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 and put them with who they need to be put with, but I just happen to have the brothers right on Staten Island, Jim and Bill, they're just wonderful, and they're right there, and again, community. Um, I learned that my honesty and humility is tested at meetings, and it benefits the group to expose my weaknesses, because it weakens the hold. It's these weaknesses that bring us together. Um, you, you know, I learned things, I'm just going to get very practical here, I mean, it's it just things like I remember, you know, being at, you know, I'm at a gas station, and if I see a, a, a man at the other pump and, and, and I get a charge, you know, I, I don't have to enter into it. I don't have to let it consume me. I can learn to just say, you know what? We're equals. He's not better than me and I'm not better than him. But that's chastity. And that helps me. And that help, but, it, but it's constant. It has to constantly be practiced. Very men will say that happens to them and what you do right away, acknowledge the feeling, don't repress it. I mean, that's what you know, got me here in the first place is the, rep the repression. But acknowledge it, you know, the old, good old, solid, offer it up and say a prayer for the man. I'm telling you, you get the grace and you walk away empowered. Um, it's just about getting rid of all the old tapes. Um, and, and I'll be honest, till this day, sometimes when I'm in a room with other men, I, I have to remember that. I, I'm not less than them, nobody's better than me, we're all the same. I, you know, I could feel awkward or out of place, but you know, just just enter into it. You're not that little boy anymore. Just enter into it. Just listen. Don't give into it. You know, it, 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 it just. And you realize it's a blessing with those thoughts, and when you act upon that, when I act upon that. Um, another another just quick story I just want to say because these are the things that helped me I remember being in my courage group I'll just say John he's married a, a father of six and a married man father of six he's sharing at a meeting one day you know how he was driving and you know made contact with another driver and you know you get the charge the charge came but really you know what he said he said like you know it's old somebody noticed me you know, it's just feeling non-existent or just feeling that, that need to be affirmed. <laughs> also, another story that hit me hard. I remember a courage member came to me who's now married with kids. Came to me at the, in the New York office and after some idle chit-chat looked at me and said, you know, Angelo, it doesn't go away. And I said, yeah, but you know, your desires are in a different place. You know, you've done a lot of work on yourself. You go to, you know, courage meetings. He's, he, he's gone to gym. He knows about 12 steps. So, you know, you work it now. You just work it. It doesn't, it doesn't completely go away. I mean, different periods in, in my life, and when I'm feeling more vulnerable or out of control, it's going to kick in. The driving forces, the, the, what, what's driving the SSA feelings, and that's what I try to work on the insecurity. I remember there's so much to be said, you know, uh, I get calls at the office or even at home, and so, you know, and I just remember, you know, saying, so you had a fall. You had a fall. That's, you know, you acted out with another person or engaged in autoerotic episodes. It's a new day. It's a new moment. Don't let it just, you know, you, you don't have to fall apart for the next three weeks. 
just get up, brush yourself off with a contract height, and go on. You know, I, I just go on my way, and I just praise God. And I really think that's why the good Lord fell as many times as he did. He's the model. You know, Father Harvey, I, I remember would say that, you know, from the constant sharing of experiences, each member draws strength to practice virtue, and no longer does he feel alone. And I, you know, a big part of my healing came, and you know, it, 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 it comes from forgiving, and I can remember the moment, and it was a moment of grace when it hit me so hard. I remember saying, do I really think that my father didn't love me? I mean, such compassion and understanding came, came upon me. It's just like something just lifted. It was all that perception. Um, you know, as a courage member, I'm always trying to work the five goals, which are, which are foundational to this apostolate. And you might say they're my marching orders. As an addict, there is a need to be continually restored to the human race and avoid isolation. I am so blessed, life-giving, it's a, to have these healthy, chaste relationships, these friendships. I just want to share now my memory of Father Harvey. Now I wanted to get just... I immediately see the Irish smile when I started writing this. <laughs> Although he made it clear to me that he was raised by an Italian uncle in South Philly. <laughs> It was uncanny how Father, at his age, would reenact a Phillies game, play by play, with all the vigor of the Sandlot Southpaw that he was. He beamed. <laughs> Once Father hit 90 and began to come to terms as a man with his physical weaknesses, we would walk together arm in arm at the end of the workday to the rectory at St. Vincent de Paul and talk about all sorts of things. I'm just giving you some memories. It's not really connected. It's just how, how it came to me. It was just, I cherish those moments. And Father was so pastoral, as you all know, very desalian and gentle, especially when it came to counseling. I, 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 I remember a story. I remember him being on the phone with a 16-year-old from Long Island, and you know, Father had listened to him for a little while, and, and he, you could obviously tell it was, he wanted to talk, and, and I heard Father say, no, excuse me, like, didn't I let you talk? Now, now can you just let me say something? <laughs> you know, he just had a certain way. Um, but don't, you know, don't any of you think that that came easily for him? Um, Again, Father was a South Philly scrapper. He, uh, he, had, he had an Irish temper, and I identified with that, and pastorally, Father knew that I had a temper. It was sort of like a punch first and talk later. <laughs> uh, but he had to learn how to fund that. You know, he really, he, he really did. Uh, uh, you know, anybody in the office can remember, you know, Father, <laughs> I could just hear him say, oh, hell. He says, oh, hell. Don't these people know we have a lot of work to do? Damn it. <laughs> but you know what was beautiful? Five minutes later, I would hear, I would, almost, I would hear, I'd say, uh, he would say, uh, 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 and I'd look up and he'd say, I'm gonna be all right now. I'm, all right now. I'm gonna go back to work. Um, uh, but I, I watched Father exercise self-mastery and obedience, you know, by always praying the breviary. Um, he's just an old religious, and he was very disciplined. Uh, Father was a, he was a real stickler for time. I can almost see him right now letting me know that there's a, I have three minutes. Uh, <laughs> write, write down, um, scheduling the conference, on a call in the office. He would often hang up, <laughs> hang up the phone, look at the clock, and say, oh, 22 minutes. It was, really, it was really something else, but he had everything right, you know, right down. Or, or, or he'd write a letter to a bishop and say, you know, like, uh, nine minutes, I, I took care of that. <laughs> but, but, you know, it really wasn't about, you know, it, it was really about how do I fit everything in that God wants me to do? It really, it wasn't like the way I would say it. You know, he, 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 
he was just great. He, he <laughs> these conferences, the Days of Recollection, um, his travel to, as he would say, help out priests and bishops. Um, <laughs> all, oh yeah, he was <laughs> all part of the, the duties of his state of life. Um, absolutely obedient to any person who was his superior. He always consulted prudently on any decision. Um, all my years working with Father Harvey, there are a few sayings that will always resonate in my mind and heart. I used to love when he would say, you don't need permission to practice virtue. When people would wanted to start a courage group somewhere in the States and they were having a hard time. Um, something else, he said, when one desires wholeness and holiness, any, wholeness and holiness, anything could happen. It's not about changing so much so. It's desiring wholeness and holiness. He would then oftentimes say, avoid fantasy, stay in reality. And then there were a few times in the years that I worked with him, he'd say, Angelo, if we don't do this for Jesus, we're fools. And then he would add a little tag and say, and I know the faces, and he would do like, you know, Lord. <laughs> it was great, it, yeah, yeah, that was his seal. Yeah, you know, I, I think it was wonderful. Father was a great traveling companion. I, I traveled with him down to EWTN. I was on uh, Life on the Rock with him, and we also traveled to New Orleans. Very easy to travel with. Um, I, I, Tina, like yourself, at the end of the workday, although by the time I worked with Father, it was 5 o'clock and not 5.30 that this guy came. <laughs> yeah, yeah, before he boarded the bus, uh, it, the, great moments, great moments. Pat, uh, it was usually Pat, Sister Dolores, and myself and Father, and he would say, you know, those little lies, he would even say, oh, it's time for a drop of the creature. <laughs> Just a thimble full, just a thimble full, and a little cracker. But I used to like, sometimes I would say, Father, is it all right, you know, if I, I said, you know, it was a tough work week, you know, if, can, I, can I have another one? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, and not that this happened a lot, because I don't actually think that, you know, that we, drank a lot, <laughs> but when there was an empty bottle, it was great, and Pat reminded me of this. He used to say, oh, it would used to go in the garbage can, a dead soldier presided over by a priest. <laughs> <laughs> so I just think that. Um, But Father, I just have to, you know, uh, um, Father had a, uh, again, sort of what Tina mentioned, and, and, and uh, Father had a heightened respect for women, and especially love for the courage women. It was really, really, really very, very um, powerful, a good example as far as that goes. Um, I remember the, the, the 90th birthday celebration was extraordinary for him. And I remember the look on his face and such gratitude and happiness for all of us that were there. And, and you know, think about, it was what Cardinal Berg said the other night, you know, that not being understood and even from his own community. So now he gets this, you know, from us. Um, when he went to Childs, you know, over the last year, when he went to Childs, Maryland, you know, it was really, so good. I, I spoke to him like nearly, nearly every day. He, he, he would call. I think he tag teamed between Tina and myself. He was just calling back and forth and attempting, he was attempting to keep office hours for himself, working for courage. <laughs> uh, he was just, you know, with the, with the boots on. Um, as he got weaker and weaker, he kept pushing himself to do everything he could do for courage and in support for Father Check. I'm blessed and we're all blessed to have had such a shining example of gentle valor in our lives. He was a good father. Thanks.
Sally. I just want to thank, thank Sam. That was great. Uh, I just want to tell you that um, I can remember many meetings with Vera uh, when you were struggling, and she would say, always spoke about you. We got to pray for my brother. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I remember so you at my first conference, so thank you. Angelo, uh, I'm here today because of Father Harvey. He came to Melbourne in 2003, and Alan and I attended that with our son and daughter. That meeting, for, uh, Dr. Peter Rudiger came, and uh, we uh, were asked to put our names down on a list to show an expression of interest, and in, you know, you know the rest. But you know, I've co I've contacted uh, New York Courage many, many times. I always get Angelo. And your, um, your loving um, line at the end, you know, may the peace of Christ be with you, or may, um, you know, some other really beautiful saying, I would always write them down, and then when I emailed someone else, I popped that on the end, and they would <laughs> <laughs> They'd probably think I was really holy. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And I was going to laugh on them. On how you always did like his impressions, you know, like you oh, always uh -huh. had like, and 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 we just do it by orchestra because because you had him down to a to a team. Well, we spent a lot of time together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, I'm a convert to Catholicism, and when I was involved with Exodus, I thought, wow, we really don't get a lot of support, and that that must be ten times worse for courage, and. Um, how did and I've heard stories about Father Harvey having tough times. How did you work in that environment where you knew it sounds great inside, but how did you deal with knowing that it's <coughs> Father Harvey deal with there's mm -hmm. not a lot of support outside? Well, he just stayed at it. It was just like he knew it was you know it was his call within a call, I guess you might say, and he knew it was his to do. He just knew that he always made himself available. He was just always there, always wanted to help. And it wasn't like he was, it wasn't about knocking down doors. It was, it would come to the office. And he just, you know, was there to support and, and, and do what he can to just make it, to make it happen. Didn't always happen, as you know. I mean, it didn't, it doesn't always happen. But he was always there. It was his to do. Yeah. Not giving up. Well, your testimony blew me away, but I have to ask. Oh, God. How did you meet the South African guy? How did I meet the South African guy? It was, you're in the city, man. You know, you just meet, you know. It's, yeah, you know, it, 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 we just, it was um, through another South African. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Have you remained in contact with any of your friends from West Hollywood? I mean, have, have, have any information about Very that? tough. Very tough. At first I wanted to, but I, I, I just couldn't. It, it, it was hard. Um, you know, when you're in the lifestyle, I mean, that whole, the, the whole promiscuity lingo is just, you know, it's so much part of the life. I tried to keep in contact with people, and, and wonder, you know, we all know great people from the lifestyle, you know, and needless, but it was very, very hard. I just had to, it, it had to stop. And it wasn't, um, I just remember I had to ask one time a very good friend of mine, you know, if he could just respect where I'm at. I just didn't want to hear about that, you know, about his sex life and what was going on. So eventually it, it just stopped. I do hear from one friend every now and again, but it just had to, and I'd pray for them. It just was it just couldn't do it when somebody's still there. <coughs> sure. Who is Angela, Pat? do you have anything to um, you recommend to your, your brothers in Christ here and you um, from in our friendship I know that you are um, not very artistically gifted in uh, in a number of areas, but also very, very, very visual. Do you practice anything like, you know, the Eastern discipline of custom of the eyes, or how do you deal with the onslaught of the visual in our current culture. No, very, very much so. Um, I mean, from going to courage meetings and from hearing other uh, my brothers in Christ share, um, 
I, I, I do. I, I try not to allow myself to, to go into, say, a, 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 a lust attack. Um, um, I yield to the Holy Spirit constantly. It doesn't mean that it takes it away. I mean, I'm just constantly yielding to the Holy Spirit. Um, and the more that I do that, I know it kind of sounds like big pie in the sky stuff, but that's what one does. I, I, I acknowledge what's going on. I acknowledge the, 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 the temptation. And then I just yield to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it works. I'll, I'll even talk about it, too, to, to get it out. You have to keep that, that you know, constant communication connecting. mentioned about the first conference. I remember talking to you at that first conference that you came to, how confused you were. Mm -hmm. And you were going back to West Hollywood and everything. And I've seen you grow through these years and how much you've become a man that I'm proud to call my friend Thank and you. my brother. Thank you. Thank you. We have seen this evening uh, such magnificent examples of the virtues of humility and courage. I'll see you down there. God bless you.